This week on Africa Weekly, we focus on Angola, where the government is diversifying its oil-dependent economy by increasing its investment in the fishing industry. We go on a ride with Burkina Faso's first female taxi driver, and we take a closer look at the pests wreaking havoc to crops across the continent. But first, a summary of the stories that made the headlines this week. Dozens of people were killed on Tuesday when two suicide bombers detonated their explosives at a mosque in the market in Nubi in Adamawa state in northeast Nigeria. Local residents said they buried more than 80 victims. The twin blasts said to have been carried out by young boys bore the hallmarks of Boko Haram Islamists. The attacks came a day after US President Donald Trump promised Nigeria more support in the fight against Boko Haram, whose insurgency has killed at least 20,000 since 2009. A suicide attack on Libya's electoral commission killed at least 11 people in the capital Tripoli on Wednesday. The internationally backed Government of National Accord said it was dealing with the consequences of the suicide attack, which was condemned by the United Nations mission in Libya. The UN is hoping that Libya can hold elections this year as it seeks to leave behind years of chaos since the 2011 ouster of dictator Muammar Gaddafi. There were two assailants who attacked the Election Commission headquarters. Shots were fired between them and security officers. Reinforcements arrived and the attackers then opened fire on members of the commission inside the building, then blew themselves up, which increased the number of victims. Two people were shot dead and dozens arrested following a police shootout at a mosque in Kampala on Saturday. Police said they had stumbled across a radicalization center at the mosque where they said over a hundred women and children were being held against their will. The mosque leader was arrested a month ago following complaints from neighbors who suspected him of disseminating extremist messages. Despite over a week of mass protests, Madagascar's president is refusing to yield to opposition demands to step down. With only seven months left until general elections, the opposition is accusing the government of trying to elbow them out of the race through new electoral laws that could bar some candidates from standing in the election. Malawi's former president, Joyce Banda, returned to the country after four years of self-imposed exile, after being embroiled in the biggest financial scandal in the country's history. Banda faces the threat of arrest over the so-called Cashgate scandal, in which government officials siphoned off millions of dollars of public money. Malawi's anti-corruption agency says Banda is still under investigation for the scandal. But the former leader denies allegations, saying that she has evidence that they were politically motivated. Banda has left the door open to another presidential run in next year's election. An abundance of fish on Angola's Atlantic coast. Employing thousands, it's a sector that's vital to the local economy. But now, ever since the collapse in the price of oil on which the country relies, Angola's government hopes fish could help to diversify the economy. The fishing industry's contribution is as important to local economies as it is to the national economy. But fishing represents less than 1% of Angola's GDP, compared to the 70% from oil. And while the industry is a stated priority of recently elected President Jao Lorenzo, investment and infrastructure are sorely lacking. More vessels are needed and more processing factories like this one, transforming the fish into oil for the cosmetic and pharmaceutical industries and producing fish flour for the farming industry to use as animal feed. We bring in 60 tonnes of fresh fish a day and that produces around 12 or 13 tonnes of fish flour. Nationally, the government wants to increase annual fish flour production from 20,000 tonnes to 30,000 by 2022. They've also announced the purchase of a specialised fishing vessel and a new port. But for the many small-scale fishermen just about making a living from the sea, the economic miracle promised by their president is as elusive as ever. Steering through Wagadougou streets in her trademark green and pink cab is Biba, 
the country's first and only female taxi driver. After initially training as a seamstress, in 2010, she decided to get behind the wheel. I already had a driver's license, so why not try to use it to earn some money? That's when I started driving the taxi, and it was fine. Some of my colleagues did say I wouldn't be able to hold down the job because it's a man's domain. Two years later, they told me, at first we said you wouldn't be able to hold it down, but now you get more customers than us. The tourism industry is one of Bieber's target markets. Over the years, she's built up a loyal clientele, including NGOs, hotels and guest houses. I call on her as often as possible when she's available, because she's often unavailable, because she's very serious, she's competent, she drives very well, very carefully. And all the customers appreciate her and even become friends with her, so she's perfect to work with. A mother of one, Bieber's day begins at 5.30 every morning and she can earn anywhere between 150 and 380 euros a month, up to eight times the minimum wage. Bieber's joined the ranks of women trailblazers in a country where men still tend to dominate certain professions. There are women who drive trailers, there are women who drive trucks, and there are even women who drive dump trucks. But with taxis, it's rare to see them because it's a form of urban transport. We take all sorts of people, so if you're not brave, for women it's a bit difficult. Bieber hopes more women will follow in her footsteps to drive her business forward and help further break gender stereotypes. Mon projet à long terme, c'est un jour avoir une société de taxi. My long-term project is to run a taxi company one day for myself and any women interested in working with me, and men too. But if a woman and a man turn up, then I'll prioritize the woman. She wants it to be air-conditioned and a 4 by 4 so she can extend her services to cover the rest of the country. This little caterpillar seems harmless, yet it causes great damage. In two years, the fall army worm has colonized three quarters of Africa, attacking the staple crop, maize. Wycliffe Nagoda, a farmer in western Kenya, was hit hard in 2017. I lost 50% of my usual harvest, so that automatically translates into 50% of your harvest, of your, you know, less income. So you have to source from outside, and last year the maize price hit its highest. Over 200 million farmers and their families grow maize as a cash crop. Experts fear if the worm is not contained, <laughs> there could be tough times ahead. It is one of the deadliest crop pests in the world. Uh, it has a capacity to attack uh, a, a number of crop species. Maize is, of course, its major preference, and maize being the staple food crop of Africa, uh, the, there is a very serious concern about uh, the threat to food security. The fall army worm is perfectly adapted for destruction. It nestles in the leaves around the head of maize, attacking it methodically, leaving behind shredded leaves or hollowed ears of maize. Its life is relatively short, a month and a half. It turns into a moth in its last two weeks, and can travel up to 100 kilometers in one night. To fight back, farmers have adopted several measures in order to try and eliminate this furious pest. Last year they used ash, uh, it worked for some. Uh, even up to soil, huh? some farmers were putting soil in the funnel of the crop, huh? and it worked for some of them. Because I think uh, it, it works with the issue of suffocation, it suffocates the pest. In the absence of a quick fix to eradicate it, researchers advocate the adoption of better agronomic practices to increase yields and compensate for losses.
Egypt hosted its first ever Air Games Festival, Egypt Air Games 2018. The festival of skydiving and paramotors took place next to the pyramids in Giza, with participants flying past the monuments as crowds watched. Next week we'll take you to South Africa, where six black rhinos are being reintroduced to a national park in Chad, where they've been extinct for decades. That's all from us at Africa Weekly. Until next week.